Hey guys and welcome back. This is part 3 of making a fly press for the workshop. In the previous videos I got the base and frame welded and machined and I also got the hole tapped with those massive taps that I made a few months back. Now in this video my aim is to get the round block made, the lead screws machined and also the guides for the round block also made. And if I'm lucky I'll also get a bit of heat treating done, although that will be dependent on the weather. So let's get started. The first thing that I'll do is machine up the round block. In a press like this, you'll actually use a screw to drive a round block, rather than using a screw directly to do all of the pressing. There's probably a few reasons why you might do this. For one, it's just going to be a lot more rigid, because once we add the guides for the round block, that's going to stop any deflection. I think if you use the screw just by itself, you'd get a fair amount of wobble. The other reason would be it very easily lets us add tooling to the fly press. You don't actually use the round block on parts directly, instead you add tooling to the bottom of it. Now like many other parts of the project, my round block is going to be a slightly different shape to most conventional ones, mostly just to make it a lot easier for me to make in this workshop, but we will get around to that later. The first thing we need to do though, is do a bit of machining to it. Now the first thing I will do, is machine down a bore with a step down. And because I don't have a four jaw chuck for the lathe that I have, this will need to be done on the milling machine with a boring head. Now the reason for the machining on this end, is this end will take the lead screw, and a retaining split ring will make the lead screw captive. That will make it so the lead screw can pull the round block upwards. With the step down now machined, I'll use the DRO to add 6 holes, which will be used to hold the split ring in place. With the top side now machined, I can now flip the block and bore out a hole on the bottom. This will accept all of the tooling. I'll then add a hole in the side for a bolt, and that's going to be there to keep all of the tooling in place. And that's the round block done for the moment. The next thing I need to do is make the split ring. And because I don't have any round bar large enough, I'll simply make it from an off cut of plate. Now again because I don't have a four jaw, I'll simply bore out the hole and do all of the drilling on the milling machine before I move it over to the lathe. Now on my old lathe, the chuck was small enough that I could hold the part on the outside of the jaws, but I simply can't do it with this chuck. So what I did was I turned down an arbor and I held the part in place with a bit of super glue. You can't do any aggressive cutting, but it does tend to work if you keep the cuts alight, and you keep the part cool. Now 
and that's a pretty good fit. A bit of heat is enough to simply soften the glue and then push out the arbor. And finally, I'll use a slitting saw to cut the part in half. With the split ring and round block now made, we can now start to make the lead screw. I'll get the part in the lathe and then clean up the top end. I'll then go ahead and turn two separate rings along the part. These are trued up and concentric and I'll be relying on them for setting the part up when I flip it. I'll then get an M12 hole drilled and tapped and this will be to keep the handle in place. I can now flip the part and then turn it down to its final size. And a bit of coolant keeps the temperatures down and leaves us with a really nice surface finish. The final thing left to do is cut a groove for the retaining ring. With all that done, I can now get it set up in the helical milling attachment and get the threads cut. Now the first problem that I did run into with all of this setup is that the part is actually way too long for the milling machine. Once you account for the dividing head, the chuck and the screw, the tailstock actually had to be pushed off at the end. I didn't really have much of an alternative around this, so I actually had to leave it like this for the whole time I was milling. The second problem I'm facing is I'm out of travel on the mill table. I can't mill out the ends and add threads to it. So I won't be able to screw it into the press, at least with it set up like this anyway. Again, I don't have any alternatives, so I am going to have to address that at a later point. Nothing else left to do, but get started. Now helical milling, like I've said in the past, is not a particularly fast method of producing screws, but it does work. And all it is, is just gearing, gearing the lead screw to the dividing head to make the dividing head move with the table. Now it does put a lot of load on the cutters, and I did break quite a few cutters doing this, so I tend to take it as slow as possible and keep the cutters cool using as much coolant as I can. You do have to be pretty careful that the part doesn't slip in the chuck, which it did once on me, and once you commit to doing a cut, you have to follow it to the very end. The setup always leaves really bad burrs, so a bit of sanding and filing does remove it. With all that done, I'll set it up in the vise with a machinist jack and then I'll cut the square head.
And that is the lead screw done. On the whole, it's okay, but I probably would have wanted it to be just a little bit better. Surface finish wise on the final pass was a little bit rough. I think the cutter was just a little bit blunt and as a result, the final pass was a bit rough. And as I also mentioned earlier, the part did slip in the chuck ever so slightly, but I did manage to catch that before it did too much damage. I also had to make the end sort of screw on, which unfortunately makes the split ring a little bit unnecessary. I guess a normal retaining ring would have worked. Although obviously I didn't know that when I made the retaining ring, so I'm just going to leave it as is for the moment. The important thing though is we did end up with a workable lead screw. Now at this point my plan was to heat treat the screw, just to give it a bit more strength, help it with some wear resistance and prevent galling between the screw and the housing. However that is going to have to be delayed just for a little bit because parts of my state are being put under a total fire ban due to the wind and the heat and using a forge outside will fall under that total fire ban. It's just something not worth risking. I've personally never been affected by bushfire, but where I used to live, we were only about 4k's away from a rather large bushfire where a few people lost their houses. So um, it's definitely something that I've seen, and it's not something that I'd worth taking any risks about. So instead, I'll get the round block guides made. Now the way that I'm going to go about it is a bit unconventional, but it should be a lot easier for me to make here in the workshop. Now I have a bunch of metal plate left over from either previous builds or just offcuts and I can cut them down to form the guides and the gibs. I'll first square up and fly cut two pieces which will form the back of the assembly. As you can probably see, this smaller piece here has two holes that's left over from an old project. Not necessary, but I decided to go ahead and plug them up. I can then weld those two pieces together. And that is how the two pieces will sit up against the frame, with the ram block pushed up against them. I can then take it to final dimension. Next will come the drilling, and I mean a lot of drilling. Each side will get 5 holes for M8 bolts, which will hold the side plates in place. The centre then gets 6 10mm holes which we used for bolting the plate to the frame. Now to save me the trouble of having to use the boring head to counterbore each of those holes, I used an 18mm end mill to counterbore them. It's a little bit big for M10 screws but it gets the job done. Next I'll get the side plates made. Now the side plates will get 5 holes on the back for holding them in place and they'll also get 3 holes at the front for the gib plates. And that's the two side plates made. 
I'll also go ahead and get the Gibbs made. And they turned out looking great. So let's do a quick assemble. Now everything probably bolts in, probably as you would expect. The side plates will bolt to the back. It is a bit unconventional, but I will be using some clamps to help set some side load onto the block. This will help ensure that there's no side to side movement in the block. Now the next thing I need to do is mill a step down in the ram block, and this will be for the gibbs. Technically I didn't have to do this, I could have made the side plates just a little bit longer to allow the gibbs to sit on the front of the ram block, but I think doing it this way makes it look a little bit nicer. And the gears will sit pretty much flush on the round block and prevent any forwards or backwards movement. The final thing left to do is add some oil grooves to the round block. And I couldn't find a huge amount of information on adding guides to this type of round block. So I'm simply going to go ahead and copy an existing pattern. Now in hindsight, I probably made them a little bit too deep for the type of oil that I'm using here, but they do seem to trap oil and it does help move it. Nothing else left to do at this point, but see if it all works. I'll first get the guide plate screwed in onto the frame, and that'll be followed by the lead screw. Now the split ring will get added to the bottom of the assembly and that will fit into the round block and then get screwed in place. Finally, I'll bolt the gibbs in place. And so far I'm pretty happy with the build. You know, I was 50-50 on the round block guides working as well as they should have been, but there isn't any play and the action is actually quite smooth. And if the side loading weakens over time, I can always add some bolts on the side to add a little bit of side load. Overall, the build looks really good and really promising. Now the final thing I want to do now is case harden the screw. Thankfully the weather has dropped and it's a lot cooler and wetter than it was before, so I think I should be able to press ahead and do a little bit of heat treating. Now unfortunately none of my packing boxes were long enough for this lead screw, so I had to go ahead and make a new one from an old piece of steel pipe. Now the lead screw goes in the box, followed by a tight packing of crushed charcoal and 5% sodium carbonate, and then it gets sealed off with some clay. And unsurprisingly, because none of my other equipment is big enough for this project, the forge also isn't big enough for the lead screw. 
So I had to leave it sticking out the top and halfway through I did have to flip the part. Now I gave the lead screw several hours in the furnace and in doing so it should get a thin casing of high carbon steel. And once that's done, I'll quench it in a large tub of salt water. The resulting lead screw was easily 65 Rockwell C in hardness, which I'll then have to temper back to a low 50 or a high 40. And also to my surprise, the packing box actually melted and partially welded to the top of the screw. I didn't think temperatures got that hot in this furnace, but there you go. In fairness though, it was very thin steel and I was only expecting to use it once. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is about it for this week. In the next video, I hope to finish this project and see if it works. Until then, stay safe. See you next week.